creditors and the public stop losing trust in concerned companies. They even unfairly, I say what, unfairly, suspect other companies of indulging in fraud without proof. Negative perceptions such as these affect the good image of the country's corporate sector altogether. It is in our common interest, therefore, to prevent negativities on the suit. Unfortunately, an isolated single significant fraud incident unjustifiably erodes the element of trust across the board. A developing economy like that of Mauritius is therefore more vulnerable than others against this kind of stigma. This is a good enough reason why the board of a company appoints from among its members a subcommittee of the board, that is the audit committee, picking up its most technically skilled independent members to do the job. The board tasks its audit committee to make a strong statement about the integrity of the company's internal procedures and processes and to affirm confidently the accuracy of the company's financial reporting. The main job of the audit committee. Having looked rigorously into the systems and procedures of the company to satisfy itself that this is indeed the case, the audit committee normally reports to the board that the accounts for the stated period have been accurately drawn up and give a true and fair view of its affairs in compliance with international accounting standards, regulatory rules, laws, etc. Board members may raise further questions with the audit committee, just as well as with other assurance providers, I mentioned just now internal auditors and external auditors, on specific matters of their concern, but they will fundamentally trust the wisdom and professional, professionalism of the audit committee, recommending adoption of the company's accounts. Just imagine the embarrassment the audit committee will find itself in if it came to light after the accounts were so endorsed and made public that some of the key results presented in the accounts were actually tainted with fraud, unbeknownst to the audit committee. This kind of situation has kept happening in the past, in different parts of the world, in all sorts of companies. It has happened because those who perpetrate the fraud act their part with meticulous care to conceal their misfeasance. In certain cases, the fraud was so big that it busted the affected companies altogether. In certain other cases, companies survived, but not without having been grievously, completely hurt. Their failure to control this factor has projected the companies, that is, the shareholders, the directors, and the executives, as untrustworthy, even though a single person or a few only in or outside the company or both may have collusively acted to perpetrate the fraud. It talks a shadow of everybody in the company. Such happenings in the lives of companies tend to project them as if their true mission is not to produce goods and services, give decent jobs to people, advance public well-being, and help raise a country's economic scope, but rather to indulge in such sordid acts as the perpetration of fraud, 
so false is not true. Reality is different from actual facts. Businesses ranging from <coughs> retail to telecoms, electronics, real estate, textiles, food, mining, banking, hedge funds, energy, accounting, television, food and vehicle production, you name it, have all fallen into to fall from time to time in as many parts of the world as you can imagine. At the mention of Bahani Mahal, recognize them not for the field of work in which they work, they were engaged, but for the big for they were involved in. This is the reality, it's surely given. Now we have had cases of fraud in Mauritius, <coughs> just as well. Even though most people would immediately think of a well publicized fraud in an important local commercial bank way back in 2003. Why should one stop there? As far as Russia is concerned. Haven't certain banks recently had to restate their accounts? Haven't others been recapitalized to the tune of several billions of rupees? Did that it compensate for assets that were overstated? Haven't finance companies with strange and higher sounding names, cooperatives and other small businesses been exposing frauds allegedly by the very persons who seem to incarnate the highest degree of integrity and trust in the concerned entities? So we ask the question, did the audit committees have all the say they would have wished to have in such companies? Did they? <coughs> you have to think about it. Were they allowed to have the say that they would wish to have in such companies? The point is, if you leave the polls, and not pay enough attention to details, fraud will somehow manifest itself from the most unsuspected quarters of the company to undermine it and its good public standing. Audit committees which are not meticulous enough can then feel singularly embarrassed when faults are publicly exposed after the fact, after the accounts have been approved. Position paper 4 draws their attention on the committees to things they may do to avoid this kind of embarrassment. Yes, companies have grown ever more complex and employ increasingly sophisticated technology to drive business. Putting pressure on colleagues and subordinates, insiders have employed this very complexity and technological sophistication. Their so-called superior knowledge to default companies. I'm talking about insiders. No one is safe. Company audit committees have to be ever smarter and vigilant even in the seemingly best of places. The objective is not solely to recover money or property lost due to fraud. It is to prevent harm at a more profound level. Loss of reputation, goodwill and public esteem the pain of those who lose due to frauds is real, not merely legal. At 
sometimes honest owners of businesses lose it all. On top of that, reputation is badly damaged long after the event. Dealing with fraud is not solely concerned with punishing the perpetrator of the fraud. Punishment may act as a deterrent against future frauds, for sure. But much more is at stake, such as the loss of the business itself, the loss of jobs of honest others employed by the victim company, a blow to the countries and its regulators international standing, and loss of public con confidence in business generally. This is especially so in a small economy like Mauritius. From all of this, one can easily make out why it is critical to safeguard the integrity of our undertakings, whether in the public or private sectors. Although we will not stop hearing about individuals cheating innocent victims through fraud of different sorts by making false representation of facts. That should not prevent us from stopping acts of corruption of systems in companies and elsewhere leading to frauds of different magnitudes. For it is in the corrupt mind that fraud starts. In his fond belief, the perpetrator assumes that he or she may not be traced out after all. Or, even so, it will take so long to sanction him or her for the misdeed. If and when found out, that people would have forgotten all about it by then. You see the assumption? Given its devastating consequences on affected companies and society, fraud has always been viewed with horror. Right is Its occurrence in one company is just one step from people full of prejudices, assuming and generalizing that all that companies at large would be indulging in all sorts of malpractices and misdemeanors. It's easy. Twisting rules, they will say companies are in the act of twisting rules, laws, the arms of politicians even, or destroying their mind, simply to get into higher profits than justified. It is like this, unfortunately. It is the duty of everyone concerned, therefore, to deal earnestly with the root cause, perpetration of fraud in the company unit. This is the message of position number four. It provides the tools for company audit committees to proactively and rigorously trace out, deal with, and prevent the perpetration of fraud in the company. Conscious of the wide ranging damaging consequences of fraud, members of the ACF here present have been working over three months now to produce position paper four. Application of its recommendations will help audit committees to not only forestall the crime of fraud, but to also help project an overall bright image <coughs> of our corporate sector, which is critical to our future economic development. I have pleasure, therefore, to put the foot of the work of the ACF in your hands for a better understanding of all that can be and should be done at the level of each and every one of us, whether in the public or private sector, to deal effectively to prevent it. <coughs> Finally, let me invite you to give a round of applause to all the members of the ACF who have unselfishly contributed to bring this paper into your hands. Thank you. Director General of ITAC, Mr. Andrew Bildau, Chairman of the Audit Committee Forum, 
Mr. Juan Carlos Fernandez Zara, CEO of the MIOD, members of the Audit Committee Forum, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am delighted to be associated with the official launch of the fourth position paper of the Audit Committee Forum. It has now been over three years since KPMG partnered with the MIOD to set up and support the Audit Committee Forum in Mauritius. Our primary mission over the years has been and continues to be to communicate with audit committee members and share information relating to governance, risk management, auditing, accounting and financial reporting, current issues, future changes and international developments. Internationally, KPMG has had the same successful partnership with the respective institute of directors in over 30 countries. We can therefore draw from these countries for content and information whilst tailoring the content to the local environment. We approach our mission by learning and focusing on issues and concerns of audit committees and other participants in the financial reporting process. We recognize that the importance of audit committees. We would hope to establish other initiatives over and above our support to the audit committee forum to serve all community members and to help them adapt to their changing role. Ultimately, our goal is to leave the directors with practical takeaways that support thoughtful, engaged discussions in the boardroom. The position paper we are launching today provides guidelines for the audit committee's assessment and response to the risk of fraud. Fraud is a pervasive and serious threat, as Standard Measure mentioned earlier. Any organization, irrespective of size and sector of operations, can face fraud risk. It is a global scourge that harms corporate reputations, costs millions, and can be a heavy economic and moral burden on society. Over the past few years, rapid technological advancements and increasingly global uh, enterprises, transactions, and financial reporting processes have expanded their opportunities to commit fraud in a variety of areas. As a result, Boards are faced with considerable challenges in dealing with these issues, and audit committees are therefore expected to take an active role in addressing these. Now, KPMG has reported on fraud trends for many years, and this year itself, we recently issued a report entitled Global, Fro Global Profiles of the Fraudster, Technology Enables and Weak Controls Fuel the Fraud. The report which I recommend you to you, which I recommend you to read is intended to help clients understand this complex field and how it is likely to change in the future. Just two interesting findings that I thought I would share with you. Consistently, the perpetrator of fraud tends to be male, 79 percent of that, between 36 and 55, working with a victim for more than six years, and holding an executive position in operations, finance, or general management. So any candidate here? <laughs> the second finding, almost a quarter of fraudsters rely on technology. Companies, by contrast, could do a great deal more to use technology as a tool to prevent, detect, and respond to wrongdoing. So I understand our guests will receive a copy of that as well. So uh, before ending, I would like to express uh, my deepest appreciation to the work of the Audit Committee for our members and also to the MIOD team for the support. So far, we have achieved a lot. Let's speak it up. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to more questions Thank you. Thank you for your presence today. Um, the paper number four and the overall initiative uh, done jointly with KPMG, I think it's a great initiative to raise awareness on very important topics. I uh, thank the participants for their time their contribution, the sharing of ideas, and in the MIOD we're looking forward to see how we can bring these papers further to dissemination, further to action, see what we can do to really go beyond the publication of the paper, but really go into the change of practices and changes of mind. Having said that, I agree with everything that has been said, with everything that is contained in the paper, but as a corporate lawyer who has been working also with um, different companies in different countries, there's also another side of the coin that one does not have to forget, which is fraud is the act of an individual, but if you look at it from the perspective of an iceberg, uh, it is the tip of the iceberg. And yes, you have cases of criminal intent, as a corporate lawyer I've seen some of those, but you also have, oftentimes, 
an underlying problem that cannot be forgotten by companies. And the underlying problem can be can have many roots, many causes, and it would be too long to list them here. But it is also important for companies, for boards, and for our committees to have an overall view, a holistic view, and understanding what is going on at the company level. Because at the end of the day, there's as much control as you can do. But someone who wants to probe will always find an exit, will always find a way. And preventing all kinds of criminal acts is, is going to be difficult. So analyzing, I mean, again, everything that is said in the paper is, is exactly correct. And it's a very good tool for, for, for boards and other committees. But one of the points that we want to bring forward as the MIMD as well, and on which we want to work with our, with our members, is trying to understand as well by taking a bit of a step back and understand all their underlying causes that they spur from from happening. I need to call out our main guest speaker. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time and look forward to your future collaboration as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Chen. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very kind of moment of this film. And I'm glad to see some of the faces that I haven't seen for a long time, some friends, but overall I'm very pleased to be here and to participate in this distinguished uh, audience and panel. I'm going to be talking about one thing based on my experience, expertise having worked in money laundering, anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, etc. recovery, and combating terrorism finance. Over the years, I'm sorry, sometimes I have this tendency to leave my speech and speak just off my head. And over the years, I think, uh, from the experience that I've gained across the world, working with an international organization, one issue has cropped up. And this issue has become more pertinent now than probably a lot of other issues. So it's an honor for me to be here this afternoon for the launching of the Mauritius Institute of Directors Early Committee Forum, position paper four, entitled Guidelines for the Early Committee Assessment and Response to the Risk of Hope. I would like to thank the MIUD, and in particular Mr. Juan Carlos, who I met recently, and after we realized that both have just only arrived. <laughs> and uh, we started a conversation, and we thought that, you know, it would be an opportunity to try and do some work together. And I think this is the beginning of this conversation. So thank you. So I've been invited to speak on fraud and corruption, but I'm going to speak on something more specific. I wish to state that I have no difficulty at all, and I think we are on the same page on everything that I've been saying so far. But I want to specify how to focus on something really specific, but related to corruption and fraud, or to fighting corruption. And this is an issue that has come back recently are the hot issue on the global <coughs> compliance and governance agenda. The issue is effectiveness of systems. How effective systems that are in place are. And I think this is an issue that we can see came up a few years back in the context of the anti-money laundering global campaign conducted by the five and the IMF. But more of it in a minute. At the beginning, at the outset, I want to make a very brief statement on the link between corruption and fraud. Some people might not see a link, but there is a link. And I think, first, we realize that fraud and corruption are often, if not always, <coughs> at the center of financial scandals that pervade the world and have done so for a long time. They are often the two sides of the same coin, in a manner of speaking. 
A fraudulent act can often either be in the form of a corrupt practice or can lead to corruption. In fact, recent events in the world of business shed some light on what is now required, perhaps more than ever before, to enhance risk management systems to prevent fraud and corruption. In that respect, we have probably noticed that recently two, e two events have marked developments in the field of regulatory compliance and governance. And how these two events present serious challenges today. First, the growing concern about new financial threats, cybercrime. Second, this despite the increasing number of laws and regulations and recommendations that are adopted to deal with financial crime. In other words, the criminals seem always to be a step ahead. We have crimes, we adopt laws and regulations, and then we have new crimes. And this cycle keeps going on and on. So in 2012, after nearly 30 years, the FATF realized that as far as money laundering and terrorism finance was concerned, there was a serious problem. So what is the end objective of it all? To try and ensure that systems are safe, that fraud and corruption are brought into control. But this is not what has been happening. Ladies and gentlemen, fraud, corruption, money laundering, terrorism, finance, and lately cybercrime are now considered national security issues. And I emphasize on the word national security issues because they undermine the stability of systems and countries, not only economic, financial, social, and whatever. Right? So in some countries, those issues or concerns are looked at as serious national concerns and threats. So in the wake of the 2007 financial crisis, financial crime, especially fraud and corruption, took center stage. When the crisis brought the financial system to its knees, and the global economy to near collapse. I think we know all about it. <coughs> Mortgage fraud, securities fraud, bribery and corruption, insider trading and dealing, libel fraud became the top of the town. We have all heard of Rita and all others. We have also witnessed recently the heist, that's more recent of the Bangladeshi Central Bank. And I do not want to list all the firms, that's not the purpose I'm here, I want to single <coughs> out, that have been sanctioned recently in billions of dollars for compliance failures in their internal systems. And how much money those firms are now investing in compliance issues? can talk about how much J.P. Morgan Chase or PwC are beginning to invest in compliance issues. It's in billions of dollars. So really, seriously, there's an issue, there's a problem. In the aftermath of the crisis, numerous instruments have been adopted to revamp the financial regulatory landscape. I mean, we've had everything. Drug Frank Act, the G20, the FSB, the IMF, the World Bank, ISCO, the International Standards Organization, FADEF, everybody. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, everybody came up and woke up with all types of recommendations. And those recommendations filter down to countries. Right? So at the end of the day, we are the receiving. We need to know how to work and grapple with things. So we've had like almost everything. 
you know, China banking, hedge fund, I can list them down. So, we have had an enormous amount of policies, recommendations, and guidelines in each area of financial infrastructure. All aimed at strengthening the financial system. Many countries have complied, they are virtuous. Mauritius did the same. We have seen that Mauritius may probably be one of the first countries that adopt an international obligation and standard, right? And we have set up a lot of institutions. So after the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, one would have thought that things would have been different after the devastating consequences of the crisis and the global economy. I mean, I was in America, I know about it. I wrote about it, right? And in the face of such decline of the world economy and the financial system, right? And the adoption of numerous regulations to deal with all aspects of the financial system. All. Right? One would have thought that the lessons would have been learned. But what have we seen? No. Unfortunately, we see that even after all the adoption of all those regulations and same song is being sung all over. Recently, two weeks ago, or last week, John Stump of Wells Fargo and the severe pressure from Congress of the South Company had no choice. So, what about Wells Fargo? That's like two weeks old. So, what happens of who is or what is Wells Fargo? Wells Fargo is the latest in the series of fraud in a bank. It is one of the four largest or biggest banks in the world, including Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup. Adding to the list of the 20 big banks fined for a total amount of $385 billion. <coughs> Fines after the crisis. I'm saying billion. There's a problem. Wells Fargo ended up with a fine of 185 million US dollars. And believe me, that's a drop. <laughs> right? So, what was the problem? They were accused of falsifying more than 2 million customer accounts to meet aggressive sales goals. And believe me, I've studied the financial crisis of 2008. What happened in Wells Fargo was really the simplest form of fraud that could have happened. Believe me. And we are not here talking about China banking or whatever. More complex derivatives instruments, you know, special purpose vehicles, whatever. But talking about the simplest form of fraud, committed by 2,000 employees in Wells Fargo, one of the fourth largest banks in the world. So, John Stump tried to fight. He couldn't. He had to step down. So, the question, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Are the laws and institutions working? I mean, 2008, 2016, that's what? Six years? But this song is still being sung out. Right? So that's why I think that enacting laws and setting up institutions is clearly, and I repeat, clearly, critical step in the process of ensuring compliance and international standards are you know, adopted, 
and implemented. However, standard setters are recently realized, and at what cost? That it was high time to move beyond and to start looking at how these laws and institutions are effective in addressing fraud and corruption. And I'm sure in question paper four, and I would not be surprised at all that you don't talk about effectiveness. I'm sure you don't. Right? Because this is the latest name in the game. Like I said earlier, it's high time to take a new look at compliance in general, and more specifically at the effectiveness of systems designed to deal with financial crime, including fraud and corruption. Hence my proposal since my arrival three months ago at the ICAN. For the need to assess and address issues related to the effectiveness of compliance systems already in place. Um, I mean, when the regulatory debate started in 2008, the big question came on the table. Are we going to keep adopting laws and regulation? Every time we have a problem, we run to the legislature. We need a particular law, an additional law. Is that problem being solved? If you look at the tax law that I adopted, I mean, I worked on the global front. If you look at the website of the IMF, FSB, ISCO, you won't believe how many recommendations, standards have been adopted. But still. So the question is, you know, what, what now? And as I said earlier, it was in that context that the father, after 20 years, having worked with countries on getting countries to implement the 40 plus 9 AML safety recommendation, did it 360, it's 360 turn around and came to realize that its system was not really working. And that's what I worked on. And I wrote about it in the book that I published on the effectiveness of the five global AML safety organization. Can I have a look at it? This is not a publicity stunt. I'm not marketing this anyway. So I don't get anything out of it anyway. So I'm just, I just brought this to show you that, you know, I wrote about it, I researched it, and I criticized the father when I was there. Because I worked with the father, but critique is critique, right? So I said, your system has a fundamental flaw. In 2007, the father started revising its 40 plus 9 recommendation. 40 is for money laundering, 9 is for terrorism. And we used to go to countries. I was part of a lot of delegations. I set up the FIU in Seychelles, right? So I've been to all the places, and we were telling countries, look, you know, you guys have to adopt those recommendations, and they were doing it. But 20 years after, the five came back and said, look, we have to have it, take a new look at it. And they started revising the recommendation, and they came up with this. Well, the change from 40 plus 9 to 40, right? <laughs> and then the big name came up. Was the system that we have put in place in countries effective? In fact, they came up with, with three new issues. I'm sure you know what. The risk-based approach, right? So what happened is that before the FADF was designing the recommendation and sending them down. In 2012, when they came up with a new set of recommendations, they asked countries now to tell us what are your risks of money laundering and terrorism finance and tell us, so it's from the top bottom to the bottom up. <coughs> so it's a 360-10, right? So what about countries? And the second thing that you will see in the fact, second is, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction or whatever, right? And the third issue, the biggest issue that came up was the effectiveness of system. And I don't know how many of you know about how the FADF works in countries, 
they go and assess and the World Bank and IMF. They go to countries and assess the compliance with those standards. And I've worked through this. If you look at the five methodology that they use now, the biggest part in those recommendations deal with effectiveness. And countries are rated on how effective their systems are. And what is effectiveness? They have a list of indicators to define indicators of effectiveness. So after 20 years, that's what happened with the FIRF. And as I said, these recommendations were motivated by one single drastic change. To understand the need for more effective system to be in place. The UNODC is doing the same thing with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. And more interestingly, ladies and gentlemen, that's new. The IMF, somebody was surprised when I was mentioning this earlier. The IMF, in its recent initiative to frontally address corruption in macroeconomic stability issues, has decided that it's going to give priority to corruption. Right? We came up with a paper entitled Staff Discussion No, Corruption Cost and Mitigating Strategies in May of this year. And it had decided that it is high time that it steps up the fight against corruption. In other words, for those who know that I am about the IMF, they work on financial macroeconomic stability issues, Article 4, surveillance and whatnot. So, the reason, one of the reasons that I was called at the IMF in 2005 was because of my previous corruption background, anti-corruption background. So, I said to them before I came, I met them. Ten years after, that's not bad. <laughs> so, now, the IMF, and this is a really strong signal, and I really congratulate it, because the legal department of the IMF is working on this issue. So they are my colleagues and I know them, right? And I say to them, look, that's a big step for the IMF to come up with a, an issue in its line of work, which I honestly believe it is. So as you see, this is how this area of compliance is evolving. But what's more interesting about the IMF paper is what it said next. The paper clearly spells out, and I quote, all of the best frameworks come to nothing. This is IMF saying speaking. All of the best frameworks come to nothing unless they are implemented. And implementation is all about effective institutions. So, as I said earlier, effectiveness is the hot issue at the moment. And now, so if you look at the final methodology, this is what it says about effectiveness. And I quote, the effectiveness assessment differs fundamentally from the assessment of technical compliance. In other words, whether you have laws and institutions, that's technical. Effectiveness is something totally different. It seeks to assess the adequacy of the implementation of the FATF recommendation and identify the extent to which the country achieves a set of outcomes, a defined set of outcomes that are central to a robust, to a robust AML CFT system. The focus of the effectiveness assessment is therefore on the extent to which the system, oh sorry, the extent to which legislative and institutional framework is producing expected results. So why am I focusing on all this? Because I think that countries are going to be faced soon with this exercise. When the IMF and FALEF or SMLAB, which is the FSRB, Part of style with you know, regional body that is going to evaluate Mauritius for its AML compliance. 
or the Indonesian Hong Kong. They are already working on evaluating measures in regard of corruption, compliance corruption, and air safety. We are working with them at the moment. I'm sure a lot of you know about that. So this process is already underway. And what it means for us at the end of the line is we'll have to show that we are effective. Are our systems effective? And we're going to be rated on that. And so this is the end of the line. And that's why it's important to understand what it all means. So, back to the audit committee's work. Financial scandals continue to put a lot of pressure on businesses to review and revisit the effectiveness of their governance framework, and of which, of which the audit committee is an integral part. Being covered by the nature, fraud and corruption represent the invisible threats and if not detected in a proactive manner can trigger a chain reaction which with damaging consequences to the business and its stakeholders. So I think I've already mentioned about this. In fact, the government framework, including the area of policies and controls within an organization, is considered an important line of defense to protect corporate organizations from financial scams and failures. Corruption and fraud, ladies and gentlemen, risk management, sorry, risk management are called upon to be an important part of the management framework of an organization. These are necessary to ensure that the systems and procedures, including its internal control mechanisms, are effective in mitigating promptly such risks, maintaining robust and flexible controls, and continually monitoring and addressing risks of potential defenses against non compliant and financial failures. The Audit Committee plays a major role in corporate governance regarding the organization's direction, control, and accountability through the mechanism of internal, for internal and external audits internal control, accounting and financial reporting, regular compliance and risk management. It has a prime responsibility to ensure that external audit and internal audit are performing their oversight roles. The overall effectiveness of the governance framework depends on its constituents in terms of a reliable external audit, a fully functional internal audit, and a perfectly audit committee. So we can clearly see the importance of the audit committee forum in this context. Since my arrival at the ICAC, I have decided, as I stated earlier, to make effectiveness the pillar of my assignment. In other words, to try and see to what extent we can develop means, ways and means to make the ICAC more effective. ICAC is, as an agency mandated to fight corruption, encourages organizations to adopt a proactive approach to prevent corruption and fraud and other malpractices. It supports business organizations to engage in developing preventive <coughs> methods as a cost-effective medium to engage in developing preventive Methods. The two main mandates of the ICAC are investigation and prevention and education. Prevention aims at engaging with business and other partners to enhance their systems in order to detect and prevent corruption. So why should companies prevent fraud and corruption? I think this is our question. A major portion, proportion of victims of fraud and corruption do not recover their financial losses. But as has been rightly pointed out, it's not only a question of finance financial losses. Reputational risk associated with fraud and corruption can have more negative impact than the financial losses. I think Mr. Gadiba has alluded to that. The board of a company is responsible for not only determining the risk that the company is willing and able to take to achieve its strategic objectives, but also ensuring that all the risks are properly identified, evaluated, and 
regulation that has the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The 1997 Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Anti-Bribery Convention. The U.S. Sarbanes Oxley Act of 2002. The U.S. Federal Sentencing Guidelines of 2005. And similar legislation throughout the world have increased management's responsibility for fraud risk management. Some of these are relevant for Mauritius. For instance, top management to adopt and promote a no fraud tolerance attitude. An inclusive approach for dealing with fraud risk. Promoting ethical behavior and cultural integrity. Regular assessment of the risk management system. As managers and directors, we should always be alert to potential risk of fraud and corruption and give due attention to organizational integrity, which includes integrity of staff. I mean, to go back to World's Forum, under staff, at World's Forum, everything appeared safe. It was running a 68% total return to shareholders. This is not bad considering that Wells Fargo sailed through the financial crisis of 2008. Or the aftermath for most of the nine years when he led the company. And he wasn't just under the banking, he was chief, he was the 2015 CEO of the year, according to Morningstar. But we know what happened thereafter. So, we are not safe unless we are really develop effective systems and put them in place. The position paper on the assessment of risk of fraud complements the Mauritius Audit Committee's forum's three previous position papers. The development and adoption of the guidelines will no doubt improve functioning of functioning of the audit committee and enhance its effectiveness. It will help the audit committee towards best practices for managing and incorporating their role in line with the code of corporate governance. I commend the initiative of the Mauritius Institute of Directors and KPMG for this initiative and their efforts for improving the effectiveness of the audit committees and trust that the guidelines will help organizations in keeping the risk management and compliance programs complete. Conclude. This is an excellent initiative on the part of the early committee forum. But I would invite the forum to ensure the effective implementation of the recommendations contained in the bill. Business is now, perhaps more than ever before, confronted with a need to design, to design and implement effective risk fraud management systems. <coughs> At the IPAC, we we'll look forward to continuing this kind of conversation with the MI Audi. My door is open, but be careful. <laughs> <laughs> with these words, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all. I've stepped over the line, maybe more than 10 minutes, but I appreciate your presence and your patience. I thank you very much for having me here. And I'll